thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I, sorry about the uh, sorry about the confusion. Um, so, I um, uh, first of all, uh, an apology that I'm I'm not my boss. Um, uh, I know you were all you're all desperate. To, this one. Okay. Um, I, I know he was very keen to uh, to come here and to, uh, um, to to attend this conference, and I've really enjoyed um, the, the last few days. And um, uh, he sends his apologies. Um, for not being here, and uh, I suspect he would also send his apologies for sending me as well, but anyway. Um, so uh, I'm a, a postdoc working in, in Tony's lab in uh, Oxford. What I want to do is I want to talk about one of our nanoparticles um, that we've been working on. I'll talk a bit about the, the physical chemistry uh, characterization that we've been doing, um, but I'll then actually go on and talk a bit more about sort of the applications that we've, that we've, we've, we've been using them for. Um, so laser is, is that one? Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Sorry. Right. Okay. So this is our this is our nanoparticle. Um, we call it a lipidisc. So it's a detergent-free uh, coin-shaped uh, lipid polymer complex, um, and it essentially it's 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 a bilayer into which we can put things including integral membrane proteins, um, uh, which is sur surrounded by an SMA polymer. So that uh, can be about a three-to-one ratio of styrene and malic acid. It's very stable um, in solution. When you actually look at a solution of this, um, it's actually completely clear. So there's no cloudiness at all. Um, it's stable over a very wide range of temperatures, so up to about 60 degrees C. So that's, that's fine for physiological range and for, for storage as well. Um, and uh, it's stable over a, a large range of uh, pHs as, as well. So you can wander around between, between 6 and 8, um, and, and things will stay, stay stable. And I think that's quite an important consideration, because if you think about producing a nanoparticle which is going to have a, a, a drug either encapsulated or inserted into it, um, then it's got to be state capable of being stored for, for long periods of time um, in a fridge, possibly even at room temperature, before it's actually uh, given in to, uh, to the patient. Um, so one of the first things we did was actually, as, uh, um, as Professor Baranholtz has said, is try to determine the size. And this is a really, uh, as he said, it's a really key um, thing you have to do first of all. So we did this by a, a variety of methods. First of all, have a look at the, um, uh, the EM. So these are our particles. Um, they're quite sweet. Uh, we have the various class averages down the bottom, uh, and we get a diameter of about 10 nanometers. And just by sort of looking at what we've seen sort of so far in the conference, I think that's probably on the sort of slightly smaller size um, for, for the nanoparticles that have been discussed um, so far. We've also done this by um, we've also done this by uh, dynamic light scattering. Oh, I haven't got the, the figure, and again we get uh, we get we get a similar result. So. Um, um, yeah, so there's a bit of NMR now. So this is the, the simplest type of NMR experiment. Or one of the simplest type of NMR experiments you can do is a, a, a nosy experiment. So if you drag your memories back to your undergraduate days, probably the very first two-dimensional NMR spectrum that you were ever introduced to um, was a nosy. And essentially what it's trying to do is it's trying to um, show you which chemical groups are close to each other um, through space. So the rather terrifying figure on the right-hand side of this slide is actually the spectrum that we get. Um, the, the main diagonal is kind of where all the action is happening in terms of the individual resonances coming up. Um, but actually key for us here now uh, is this cross peak over here at the side. And that's the cross peak which indicates uh, that the uh, styrene group here, this aromatic uh, protons here, are actually able to talk to excuse me, actually able to talk to the uh, CH2 protons within the lipid. So this is completely consistent with uh, uh, the picture that I drew earlier on um, of uh, a, a disk of lipid, which is actually then stabilized by the polymer wrapping around the outside of the, of the particle uh, like, like, a, like a coin um, stabilized on, it, on its rim. Um, the phase behavior is uh, very interesting as well. So we can form these um, lipidisks with uh, a variety of different um, uh, lipid types. So this is uh, a lipid called DMPC. If you're not a lipid person, then that, that's fine. I know these uh, acronyms can be a bit confusing. But DMPC is essentially one of, kind of the standard lipids that everyone reaches for as their first kind of suck it and see, let's just try it. 
Um, GMPC itself is, is quite interesting. So if you look, to, look at the, um, the dotted line here, this actually shows you the phase transition that DMPC uh, will go through. So there's a sort of a mini phase transition at around 12 or 13 degrees C, and that relates to the reorientation of the lipid head groups. Uh, and then you get a full, uh, very sharp, highly cooperative phase transition, which actually happens... Um, uh, as you as you go from the the, the sort of the, the, the kind of the full uh, uh, liquid uh, the full gel phase into the liquid crystal phase, uh, what happens inside the lipid disc? Well, that's the continuous line, um, and uh, in fact, what we do is we lose the cooperativity. Now, that shouldn't be a huge surprise because actually we're looking at about 50 to 100 lipids per disc. So, in terms of actually talking about the sort of the phase properties of a system of that size, um, you know, we're getting to the point where actually it's no longer sensible to talk about phase because there are so, so, so lipids, because sort of lipid phase, if you like, is a sort of a bulk thermodynamic um, uh, uh, property. Um, but it suggests as well that these systems are a little more ordered than uh, DMPC would be in a, in a dispersion or in, uh, in multi-mile vesicles on its own. Um, so one of the first uh, uh, things that we've done with this is we've actually put an integral membrane protein. This again is another probably one from your undergraduate days. Um, so this is bacteriodopsin, which is the light-driven proton pump um, from Halobacterium. Um, and what we're able to do is we're just able to put this straight into the disc. We don't require any detergent for this at all. Um, and uh, then we can actually measure the properties of this particular protein um, and compare them to what the, uh, the, the dynamics of the protein uh, that it would actually have in its, in its native membrane. So over here on this side, uh, you can actually see EPR spectra. Um, EPR is the, the kind of close cousin of NMR. Um, and what we're looking at here is we're looking at the motion of the spin label groups um, attached to various points on the bottom of the, the protein here. And actually, you can see that the nanoparticle, the lipidisc um, environment, actually replicates the natural membrane. So that's this purple membrane here, uh, really well, well, and actually uh, somewhat better than the, the OG. So this is detergent. You can see that these lines here are a lot sharper, and that indicates that there's a lot more flexibility in a detergent sample for an inter integral membrane protein um, than there would be in a, in a disc. So I'm going to move on now to just show you how we've been exploiting this. I and mean, we've heard a lot about um, uh, different sort of pharmaceutical targets. I suppose um, we have chosen, in, in, in Oxford at least initially, to go for a slightly lower bar. Um, and uh, that's to uh, kind of exploit these for, um, for uh, cosmetics and cosmetic type products uh, that actually go into the skin. So I've got two of the products um, that lipidists are actually used in. Um, first on the left hand side, this is on sale in the Far East. Um, just as British teenagers and dare I say Swiss as well um, are very keen to go into uh, uh, tanning salons to lie on sunbeds and to put fake tan all over them, um, in the Far East, as you may know, the, the trend is actually to do the opposite. So most of the cosmetics, in fact almost all of them that are sold in the Far East, actually include some sort of skin whitening ingredient. Um, and that's exactly what ours does. I'll show you that in a second. Um, kind of closer to home, this is uh, sold in very high-end department stores in the UK, um, Harrods and Selfridges and the like. Um, this is actually a product for getting uh, retinol, so a form of vitamin A, um, into the skin where it's supposed to help. Um, uh, to, to, to reduce wrinkles and plump up the skin and, and, and things like that. Um, so why this particular system for the skin? Um, well, we're actually able to get the discs really down to the very bottom of the stratum corneum. So that's the outer layer of the epidermis, and it's essentially the kind of the zone of the dead cells. So we get the disc down, um, and how do we test that? Well, we've done this with, uh, or, or the, the company in concerned has done this in association with Mulvan, um, and we take strips off the top of the skin, uh, and we're tracking the presence of uh, a fluorescent dye, which is actually covalently loaded into um, the disc itself. And we can see the appearance of this dye, I die on the, excuse me, on the 14th strip, indicating that we're actually getting the, the disc itself down to the bottom of the, of the stratum corneum. Uh, we can put an active inside, uh, and what are we trying to aim for? We're actually trying to get uh, an inhibitor to reach the melanocytes. So I was mentioning um, the skin whitening. It's the melanocytes which are responsible for producing melanin, which is the, the pigment, the dark pigment that gives you sort of skin tone. Um, and they reside right at the very bottom of the, of the epidermis. It's a layer called the stratum basale. Um, 
what are we trying to deliver? Uh, well, we're trying to deliver this compound here. It's an inhibitor of the enzyme tyrosinase. And tyrosinase uh, is responsible actually for catalyzing um, three different steps in the pathway that actually will produce um, melanin. So it's these three parts here. This is actually the mushroom enzyme rather than the, uh, the human enzyme. There isn't a human crystal structure. Uh, and the inhibitor actually functions as a, a molecular umbrella. So it comes over and it will actually block um, the active sites just by binding on the outside of the protein. This is a copper-rich protein. It's, it's responsible for, for, for doing redox reactions to get the tyrosine uh, into this indole quinone uh, form. Well, that all sounds very nice, uh, but does it work at all? Well, the aim is not just um, to... Uh, to, to whiten skin generally, um, but also to uh, kind of address sort of the blotchiness, and this happens in, in uh, peoples from all around the world, uh, these blotches, these darker spots which actually occur um, a, a, as you get older and, and, and as you age. And in particular to sort of break down, I suppose, the, the kind of the outer um, uh, kind of defining sort of uh, a region between sort of the normal skin color and then the, the darker color. Um, so this is done after um, 30 days treatment. You can see there's a sort of a slight reduction here in the, in the, in the spots. Um, and then particularly if we zoom on, it's actually getting rid of the kind of the sharp edge, if you like, between the dark color and not the dark color. So why have we gone for this, this particular system? Um, well, in the Far East, um, things aren't categorized quite as neatly um, uh, as in Europe, perhaps. So there is a third category of, of, of drug. We have something called a quasi-drug, which sort of sits midway between uh, the cosmetics and, uh, uh, and kind of true pharmaceutical compounds. And actually, if you're trying to deliver something which has already been passed, um, then your, your particular product will f fall into this, this quasi-drug um, category. And it, and it makes just getting into the patient uh, uh, a, a lot easier. You can see we've gone through various stages of... of excuse me, of, of clinical trials as well. The important thing as well is that if you are um, selling to the consumer, your product has to work. So in the cosmetics industry, um, it said that if you don't actually manage to give a visible uh, result after 30 days, then your consumer will not come back and you won't sell any more product. Um, and we've been very fortunate. We're actually, or the, the company concerned is actually selling this through um, the, the sort of the top um, a Japanese shopping channel and I think we're the, the number one selling cosmetic that they have um, and, and we're moving that into to more territories as I say uh, including, including Singapore. Um, and then finally in Europe, so this is sort of coming into Poland, I think we'll be in Hungary um, soon. We're also, as I mentioned, able to deliver um, retinol and uh, this, has, uh, this has some anti-wrinkle effects uh, as, as well as uh, skin smoothing. Again, the challenge really is to deliver something that the consumer can actually notice and appreciate within this kind of magic one month period. Um, and if you can't do that, then you won't be able to, uh, to, to, to sell on. Um, so I think I've got 22 seconds left. Um, I'd uh, just uh, like to recap by saying that lipidists are detergent-free, um, and that's very important for, uh, for sort of uh, kind of basic science applications for, for looking at, at membrane proteins. Uh, they're very small, 10 nanometers in diameter. We can get right through into the, the bottom layer of the stratum cuneum, uh, and we can have controlled release down into the, the stratum basale as well. Uh, and we're uh, exploring this uh, further for, uh, for, for tropical uh, drug delivery. So I'd like to thank uh, lots of people uh, at Oxford, um, particularly my boss, um, Tony Watts. Uh, we collaborate with Horst Vogel here in Switzerland in, uh, in EPFL. Uh, the company which sort of leads the development of this is, is led by um, Steve Tong. I'm uh, funded by, by Euromet, and, uh, and uh, we also have some funding from, from Malvern Cosmetics themselves. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. And second, you show a very unique particle. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Okay, we'll keep... Uh, you have questions? Okay, go ahead. I just had a, two quick questions. The first one is, what kind of packing density can you get with these without having them start to interact with one another? Um, so the concentration of the disc themselves. Yeah. So we can go up to about 5 mg per mil lipid. Okay. Um, so, yeah we don't push it that much higher because then we lose the then things start to become more viscous yeah and 
you're talking about the pharma or the cosmetic space, which means that people are using their fingers over and over again. Mm -hmm. How are you handling um, contamination from bacteria over and over again? How, how do you deal with that in, in your dragon blood type of a um, application? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on the particular product, but I think there are antimicrobials and, and antibacterial agents actually in the, in the cream. It's like any other a buffered, buffered aqueous cream, and the lipidisc is actually able to tolerate that. Yeah, um, I just yeah. didn't know if, um, if you saw any um, attenuation or addition where the bacteria were liking the material better because of the size or not liking it because of the size. Um, understand what I mean? Yeah, I, I yeah. see what you're saying. So the, the, I mean, the other thing is that the, the disc is negatively charged, and that would tend to be repelled away from the surface of, of a bacteria anyway. So, uh, yeah. Why is it negatively charged? Uh, because that's the design of the, the polymer. That's how it's, how, 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 it's, how it's stable. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Uri Aviv, and the topic will be... Thank you.